Got it. Here. I'm going to run downstairs. I'll be right back. I'll be back. My lift was wildly late. It was like 30 minutes late. So I'm sorry I didn't get this set up ahead of time. I don't know what world your background is from, but I, I, I feel I should be there. I made that on mid journey. I try sound again. I just I might have turned this down. Oh, I muted myself. Oh, okay. Thank you. Yeah, that way if people on the call can hear you. Unmute. Check. Can everybody hear me? Check, check, check. Oh, look, and it's got my thing up there. Uh, is anybody on? I guess Jeff, Jeff is going to monitor the Zoom call. So, yeah. Oh, we got some people. Um, if you guys have questions or something, oh, I can see the Zoom chat here. Sounds good. Oh, good. Okay. Um, so yeah, Jeff is going to be back in a minute to monitor those Zoom stuff. So if you guys do have questions, um, cancel. Okay. And like I was saying earlier, like this time it's not online. Um, we do have some people in the room. So uh, that helps me. I used to be an educator. So I've taught a lot of classes and really education is a conversation, right? It's gotta be a back and forth because, and it's even if you don't say anything, like I can tell from your posture and general demeanor, like how you're feeling about things. Um, and how do you guys feel about ice rinks? Yeah, like maybe about, you're gonna full, full thumbs up. Only language I kind of know. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, that's a good start. I came to JavaScript first and then was, uh, you know, back in the day before TypeScript was invented, like all of, well, I suppose they can't hear me very well if I'm over here. Um, almost all the errors you would get in JavaScript were type errors. <laughs> it was like every time, it was like type error of this is undefined, you know? And like, so you would notice that over time. And, and I was one of the advocates. I was one of the people in the JavaScript world who was saying, hey, we need some type safety here. I even made a little type safety library and like put it on GitHub, made a web page for it, and it never took off. But then Microsoft invented TypeScript. Um, and I didn't like it at first because it's a cross compiler, right? Because the JavaScript that you write runs in a browser. TypeScript does not run in a browser. So we write TypeScript and then there's a compiler that compiles that to JavaScript and does all the polyfills so that it works nicely in all the browsers and then ships that JavaScript to the browser. So that extra step, I've seen this before with a lot of other things like CoffeeScript. CoffeeScript was a variant on JavaScript that was just shorter, more terse, and you just ran it through a cross compiler and it outputted to JavaScript and that ran in a browser. But I saw all these teams and they converted everything to CoffeeScript. And then CoffeeScript went away. <laughs> and then they had to convert everything back to JavaScript. So that's always been the concern with cross compilers is that. But TypeScript, it's, it's made by Microsoft. And that's not always a great thing. But it means that there are a lot of smart people that contributed to it. Um, it's got a very thorough ecosystem. And of all the type checking stuff in JavaScript, it wildly took over. So it really is the case now that First, you could just be a JavaScript programmer, like in the jQuery days, and you learn some frameworks here and there. Then you kind of had to become a React developer. At a certain point, JavaScript just kind of became React or Angular. But if you look at the latest statistics, Angular is on the downslope now, and React is taking over. So to be a JavaScript programmer means that you program in React for the most part. And these days, more and more, if you're going to program in React, you want to be programming in TypeScript. Now, verbally, between my colleagues and stuff, we don't differentiate between any of those things. We say JavaScript, we mean React and TypeScript as well. 
because that's just what we work in. Um, but that said, a lot of people are still in React and haven't made that leap to TypeScript. And moving an existing project into TypeScript is not super easy. So it's it can be a little a little tough. Okay, new chat message. Chat. Could hear you just fine. You're free to roam. Oh, good. Okay, good. Yeah. As you can see, I'm a very hard to move. Um, okay, so TypeScript. So not a huge amount of experience with it. Some experience, some people like it, some people are unsure about it. I was very skeptical at first, but it won me over, over time. Um, and uh, the other thing, I'll just skip to the end really quick. Uh, most of this book, uh, oh, where'd it go? Oh, I guess I didn't type it in here. I'll just type it in real quick. Um, effective TypeScript. That's the book that I read when I first wanted to learn this stuff. I didn't know anything about it. I got that book out of the Denver Public Library for free. Yes. And you get to keep them for as long as you want. You just get in there, you say, I want it. And they send it to your local branch. And they send you a text message. It's ready to pick up. You got a week. You go pick it up. You read it. I like books. Not everybody likes books. Some people like Front End Code Camp or whatever it's called. Um, front End Masters. It has a lot of great videos. But I prefer books. I like the linear fashion of them. I like how I can page flip really quick and go back and forth between sections to jump around. I don't like ebooks, they're hard to navigate. But I like books and I read this book and most of this lecture comes out of this, this book. Um, it was a great introduction. Uh, what I especially liked about it is it doesn't start at the beginning. It's not like a tutorial and here you go, step one, two, three. No, it just jumps you right into the details. Um, it's, I think it's called 99 tips and tricks or something like that. So each chapter is just a new tip and trick, new detail. So that's stuff. So yeah, any thoughts, questions, comments, just in general about TypeScript? Yeah. Uh, do you know the book that teaches both React and TypeScript together? I don't. I don't. There are, there are a lot of React books. Um, I think there's a difference. There's a big difference between being a beginner at React and being an, an advanced React user. And that is learning how to use reducers, um, I think is the main skill difference there. And a lot of the books don't really teach that stuff very well. They don't teach architecture, but you can get a React book and learn the language and then get a TypeScript book and learn that. I think it would be two separate books. When the other TypeScript book they have at the library um, is called Programming TypeScript. And that one is more step-by-step -step if you're looking for that like step-by-step -step guide and it does use React. So it is about TypeScript, but React is under the, under, underneath it as well. Wow. It's a reducer. Um, a reducer is a way of maintaining state in your application. So uh, if you have a, a toggle and it's an on-off toggle, when you create the component for that toggle, that component can have state internal um, in, you know, it's a const toggle on, oops, comma change toggle equals use state. Um, and, oh, I forgot a square bracket there. Oops. oops. All right. So, uh, you know, it's giving me a squiggly because use state is not uh, imported, but this is one way of doing state management. So here we would change anytime they click on the toggle, we're going to change the value using change toggle and toggle on just has a true false value as to whether the toggle should be on or not. This maintains it directly in the component, which means if the component is unmounted and then remounted, it goes back to its default value. A reducer is a way of storing state outside of the component so that when the user goes to change the toggle, we send off an action. That action notifies the reducer that something has happened and we want to change the state. Um, the reducer then changed the state and the reducer, when the state changes, that re-renders the view, that re-renders the component. And that way the component is then always receiving its value from the reducer rather than feeding in a new one so that when you refresh the page or unmount the component, remount it, it still has the state value from what you had before. So reducers are a long-term way for maintaining state. Use state is the short-term way. And use state is what you learn first. And a lot of people would go way too far with it. 
and it just has a lot of limitations. So, use reducers as part of using Redux. Do they exist outside of Redux as well? They do. I don't remember what name they have, but um, use reducer. <laughs> what use reducer? Oh, actually, they are still called reducers. Yeah. Okay, that was that was going to be my follow up question. Is I remember I remember Redux the add on using the term reducer, but I don't mm. remember what they were called in. But I don't remember what they were called in just React once they actually adopted it. Yeah. So I guess that's what they're called. They're still called reducers. That's helpful. In React, yeah. There's a hook now in React called Use Reducer. Reducers were originally invented by Facebook, not the reducer, that word. Um, that's just kind of its role. What we're really talking about here is the main differentiator between React and just about every other language, every other framework. It's the one directional design pattern. If you recall, in the, you may know in the past that most software was developed using the MVC design pattern, and that was model view controller. The model stored the data, the view was dumb, and the controller navigated between the two. And that's how all software was made for a really long time. And it was never very appropriate to the front end. So along the way there, finally, we tried a whole bunch of other stuff. There was MVVM and MVP and all these other ones that didn't really work well. Eventually, Redux came out. And Redux was the first major language uh, to use this one directional design pattern. If you notice with MVC, model view controller, the controller is going back and forth. And there are always these cases where like the view says to save something. And so then in the front end, we would display it's saved, but then it'd go to save it and, and encounter an error. Well, now it's gonna go back to the view and like undo the save and like tell it it didn't save. And it's this back and forth that the controller had to do that was always so troublesome. So one directional design pattern solves that. Components, what we call views, those are still dumb. They send off actions. The actions go to the reducer, the reducer re-renders the view. It's only one direction. All data always flows in that one direction. And that's what's getting good at getting at, being, at React. I think that's what that is, is getting good at the one directional design pattern. Because it's the main differentiator. And it's beautiful. It makes it so fun to program. Because you just go to one place and it sends the next. And then it goes to the next. And then it goes to the next. And now you have a new feature. And you just took a circle. So that's what's nice about it. I think it's a long-winded answer. But does that kind of hit the get where you're asking? Yeah, yeah. It was, as soon as you said it, I, I kind of remembered using them, but I, I knew that as part of Redux to, Toolkit. Yeah. I'm fairly new to this, so so I kind of learned the basics of the user state, then went straight into adding the Redux Toolkit. So I didn't know that the reducers existed outside of Redux. That's that was what. Yeah. If you're using Redux, then you can have then that's better. Um, reducers are built into React now, but they're clunky. And so Redux helps like with sugar to make it look better and just be less boilerplate code. Um, and Toolkit is even better than what Redux was before that. So yeah, I, I fully approve that. Tool. I'll introduce you to Mark Erickson, who's one of the main organized uh, maintainers of Redux and Redux Toolkit. Yeah, please. Over there. I'll introduce her. Uh, so reducers, yes, yeah, started in Redux when Dan Adamov introduced Redux at React Comp. 2009 ish, yeah, sure, something like that. And it, it's the flux pattern. So, reducers, if you actually look up flux, you'll, you'll get that unidirectional workflow. That's what Facebook originally called it. And Facebook, Dan worked for Facebook, so use reducer just kind of came along. Sorry. Not at all. Not at all. I know that's why I'm here. I mean, like, uh, we can jump around at any topic you guys want to talk about. We could probably do, I could do an entire session on state management, talk about use state, use reducer, and uh, like local storage, other ways that you might do that stuff. But I would love to demonstrate the one directional design pattern and show you guys how, how elegant it can be. Um, Stellar Elements, that's the company I work for. I am not on talking on behalf of them. I do not represent them. There is no warranty. I'm legally obligated to say these things. Um, and math words. I had this like flowery math intro for this that I'm all excited about. But you know, I know when I was new at this stuff, people would use math words and it would scare me. 
So try not to be scared. That's what I'm saying. It's just a little intro and then we'll just jump into code and then it'll just be code. Yeah. So uh, in mathematical terms, TypeScript is a set. It is a set of types. Uh, and a long time ago, this mathematician came up with a theorem in set theory uh, that said that any set of types can either be complete or be consistent, but it, they can't be both. No set can be both. So TypeScript had a choice to make. Should it be complete or consistent? It decided on complete. So what does complete mean? Complete means that anything in JavaScript, anything in the entire world of the language of JavaScript can be represented by TypeScript. TypeScript is a complete representation of JavaScript. Yay, means there's no extra little bits that don't fit. But in order to make it complete, in order to fit all those little extra bits, had to be inconsistent. What does inconsistent mean? Inconsistent means that it doesn't follow the laws of logic. Like in terms of logic, it can't be. And computer science is just applied mathematics. So, you know, we can bend the rules a little bit with computer science and that's what TypeScript does. So TypeScript's one inconsistent part, the one part that doesn't make any logical sense is the any type. It's magic. Uh, in mathematical terms, it is both a superset of every other type and a subset of every other type, which is like you're your own grandfather. <laughs> right, that doesn't make any sense. You can't do that. But, you know, fancy magic and we can make it work. So uh, any, basically what it does is it disables type checking. So it can be a real helper, like a developer convenience. You're going through stuff. And if you learn TypeScript and JavaScript at the same time, that can be hard. Sometimes it's hard to differentiate between the two. When you learn JavaScript first, you can clearly see what the TypeScript errors are. And sometimes you just want the TypeScript to go away. You just want it to stop erroring so that you can focus on the major problem that you're trying to solve. Um, so it can be a convenience, but it disables type checking. It breaks contracts and it spreads. And those are the three things that we want to look at. Those are the three dangers of using the any type. Um, so end result, the unknown type is always better than any. And we'll also look a little bit at is functions and compare them to the as keyword in TypeScript. Any thoughts, questions, comments about any of that? Okay, the whole way it didn't lose y'all. Okay, so again, let's try to look at uh, JavaScript versus TypeScript. You know, in JavaScript, we say, you know, let foo equal, and it can equal anything. It can be a string or whatever. But in TypeScript, we need to tell it what this thing is. Um, and TypeScript has inference. So if you have something that's really obvious, like a string, you can see that it did, in fact, type it as a string. So it inferred that. So you don't need to like be super explicit about everything. And in most cases, we want to use the inference engine as much as we can to try to you know, not have to put in all of these specific types. OK, so that's generally what we're talking about. And I've got these three variables here. And you can see what's on the right hand side of the colon here. This is what the type that I've declared this as. And coming from JavaScript, you know, this is an empty object pattern. And if I hover over this, I can see, yeah, this variable is typed as an empty object. So it's an empty object. It's an object with no properties, right? Wrong. Actually, the empty object pattern in TypeScript does not mean the same thing as it does in JavaScript. And lowercase object, but here I put an array in, and yet somehow the lowercase object type still accepts an array. Here, uppercase object, I put a number in. It's like no TypeScript error. It's so totally fine. These are weird. These are weird examples. These should not be true. These should be erroring. This is what we want TypeScript for. Is when we put something wrong, it should tell us. That's what the whole point of the language is. So why is this true? <clears throat> and in order to understand why any and unknown are different, we need to understand object. We need to understand how object works in TypeScript. So I made a barn, um, my object barn here. Here's the four different ways of, well, <laughs> four plus ways of defining an object uh, in TypeScript. So we can call it uppercase object. Now this works, but never use it. 
the same thing's true of number. Um, like we will type things as lowercase n number, but we never use capital N number. The, in, in whether it's capital N number, capital A array, capital O object, those are all the JavaScript classes. We don't want to link together TypeScript definitions and JavaScript definitions. We don't want that. So we don't use the JavaScript classes. The lowercase o, that means it comes from TypeScript. And unfortunately, the lowercase o object in TypeScript can be an object, an array, or null, or undefined. That's terrible. It's just in specific. It's not what we wanted. We know it's an object. We want it to be an object. TypeScript just doesn't offer a way to say that. We, if we put in the empty object pattern, it's not undefined and not null, but it can be a string or a number. That doesn't help us. Again, these things don't mean what we think they mean. Now, this is the ideal case. This is what TypeScript wants us to do. It wants us to say it's an object, and here are the properties. And here are the types of those properties. This is called a shape. It's a shape of an object. And the problem is a lot of times when you're doing this stuff, you end up putting a property in and then later you decide to take it out and you're left with an empty object pattern, which does not mean what we think it means. So you gotta be just a little bit careful about that one. Now here's the true definition of an object in TypeScript. I believe this is correct according to the specification. Uh, in TypeScript, record simply means an object, just another name for an object. And then it has this odd syntax of angled brackets where we provide one and two properties. And the first property is the type of the keys in the object. And the second property is the type of the values in the object. Um, and according to JavaScript spec, keys of objects can be strings, numbers, or symbols. It's a symbol again. I don't care. It doesn't matter. You never have to use one, but it is in the specification. So we include it here. Um, a lot of people will just say, we don't need symbols here. We don't need numbers. It's just a string. So the keys are all going to be strings and the values are all unknown. We don't know what they are. And that's legitimate. We don't. We don't know what they are. But then you can use this generic object type to type your generic objects. And that will say it's a it's an object. It's going to have some keys, but we don't know which ones, and we don't know what the values are going to be. And this is a great little recipe. Uh, this is a great one to copy and use on project after project. Um, because it does mean what we think it means. Uh, and just really quick, one problem, one difficulty with learning TypeScript is there's two different syntaxes. So this is the equivalent of this. It's the same thing, but this uses the square notation and this uses the angle notation. It just makes it hard to learn. It's annoying. I try to keep all my stuff with very consistent notation and not use any of this stuff, but it's up to you. All right, any thoughts about any of that? It's pretty straightforward. We got objects down. We're like feeling good about objects a little bit. Okay, let's look at this danger for any. <laughs> Um, well, this, this is a really obvious one. We set age to 12. We were kind of expecting a number there. We got a string. And so then when we add one to it, we get one to one. There's a bug. It should be, should be, you know, giving us a TypeScript error. And if we had typed it properly as number, then it would give us a TypeScript error. We would say, hey, like, you gotta put your number in there, you're going to get a bug. But with any, TypeScript is disabled. It just disables all type checking on that. No more errors. They got the errors to go away. TypeScript is easy. Yeah, just put any on it. <laughs> and then you don't have any TypeScript. And it doesn't catch errors. Same thing here. If, if we had a you know, function that worked on a date, we would assume inside there that that's a date. But if we type it as any, um, well, then we can call it with a string or a number or something else. We can assume the function would break. But there's no type checking here because we used any. Um, and these are the ones that I see most often. Um, this handle error, I see it all the time. And the reason people put any here is because they're like, well, there's this error object that's coming into my handler. And I don't know what that error object has. It's going to have like 40 different properties. Like, I don't want to sit here and define every property that is returned in an error object. 
you know, by a, by a text area or something. So you don't have to define all the properties. Um, and in fact, unknown is a drop-in replacement. And so these, these problems with any that we see, like it breaks contracts and it spreads, and we'll, we'll look at examples, unknown doesn't have any of those problems because unknown makes logical sense. <laughs> unknown is not inconsistent. So uh, here, all they had to do is switch it to unknown. This is publishable code. With any in there, I would not consider that to be publishable code. I would ding it on code review for sure. Um, in my opinion, any should not be checked in. Uh, this one's a little more difficult. This is another common, just a callback. It's going to get a result probably coming from an API someplace. Again, we don't know what all the API is going to send us. And then we try our new trick. We're like, unknown. Aw. Boo. It says result of type unknown. Uh, wait, what does that say? Yeah, it says the result is of a type of known. So it's not a very helpful error message. But what it's saying here is that we said dot detail. We know something about the result. We know it has a detail property. And the reason, again, that the developer put in any again is they're like, well, yeah, we know it has detail, but it's probably going to have a whole bunch of other stuff. And I don't want to define all that other stuff. We don't have to define all the other stuff. We just define the part that we know. And now it's happening. Does that make sense? Any part we use, we just tell it that part's going to be there. What do you call the dot detail part of result dot? The property. Property. Yeah. Uh, so that's how you would define a, an unknown property. And yeah, if, if it doesn't know what the result is, yeah. And if we put an unknown here, um, then it's saying that's us telling TypeScript we truly do not know what the shape of the object is. We don't know what the name of any of the properties are. And then we get here and it's like, yes, you do. So yeah, it just wants us to go back. So if, if you're doing that, it would just be return result, no dot detail and unknown, and you get the full object through. That would be fine. Yeah, exactly. If we take detail off of here, then TypeScript's like, eh, you got something you didn't know what it was, you returned it. And you look at the function definitions, it's gonna say, well, it receives unknown and returns unknown. Whereas if we had any here. Well, then, yeah, it's going to return in any, and that's where we'll see any start to spread. Now you're in, logic, now you're in radical logic anarchy, and things are going to uh, things are going to get worse sooner or later. Yes. <laughs> My favorite is when doing TypeScript, open source modules, importing out of someone else's library. It's like, oh, we added types, man. It's just a bunch of any's. You're like, guys, <laughs> you're awesome. This is fine. <laughs> <laughs> there have a, a lot of libraries do try to create uh, include their own types most imported libraries have decent types and there was an initiative recently where all the libraries that didn't have types a bunch of people got together and just went and made types for them so there's like open libraries for all the types now <laughs> like it's sounding like is the a lot of the is that you, is that you still have to watch for those types just including any Correct. Yeah, they're not going to be perfect. Um, and sometimes it's not even just any is the problem. Like sometimes they'll just define it as a generic object. And you're like, well, then, but what's in it? <laughs> like, I, that doesn't help. Or um, sometimes they'll have an enum where it's going to be one of three different distinct strings, but they'll type it as string. So then you're like, I don't know what the options are. So yeah, it's not going to be perfect. The project you're talking about that definitely typed. Uh, repository. I think that is the one, yeah. Okay, any spreads. So let's look at how the, the anarchy can spread. <laughs> um, here is an imported function. They used an any. And then they parsed something and they return it. And we want to use their parse something function to write a parse YAML function. And it's going to provide some YAML. And we're very studious. We say it's going to be a string. And then we call their function. But their function starts with an any and returns an any. And so our function, even though it receives a string, since it returns the result of their function, it returns an any. So then our code, we actually want to go use our parse YAML function and we pass into it some really nice YAML. And uh, well, but it's still of type any. 
because it is the result of this function. So the inference says, well, it's going to be any two, which means we can come down here and we call book.fantasy, which clearly doesn't exist. We can call book as a function. Totally won't work. But TypeScript seems happy with all of this stuff. And it's all because it's all any, all the way because of this any two imported files back from the code that we're actually writing. So yeah, you got to watch for them. And then I've seen these a lot out in the wild and they're valiant, they're valiant attempts. It's like the developers are like, I know any is not good. I don't want to use it, but I don't know what else to do. So I'm going to just try and put some structure around it. You know, it's a record, but you know, it might have any values. And again, we already learned like unknown would be way better here. Um, and this one, like it's a promise of an array of any's. Great, but eventually the promise is gonna resolve. And eventually you're gonna try and access something in the array. And then what do you have? An any. So even putting structure around them doesn't help because the structure ends up going away. And then you're just left with any. Okay. Uh, so this is a quick trick uh, that was in the book that I thought was pretty neat. Document.animal. Document is part of the window object in the browser. So we should definitely never be storing data inside the document object. You might read something out of document, but you're not going to add things to document like an animal. But you know, th that's not exactly the point. Like what if we import some library and we have to add a variable onto this object, but this object already has a very thorough definition. In this case, it's the document. And if I uh, command click, whoop, command click, I can go look at document. Here it is. Here's the definition for document. Yeah, and it's all of this. And I'm like, uh, I don't want to redeclare all this. I don't even understand what all this stuff is. Like, I don't want anything to do with this type. And yet that's the type of document. And we want to set this variable on it. Why do we want to set a variable? I don't know. We have to. Let's just say we have to. We're using some third-party integration, like double click. And they're like, you have to set a variable on document. Okay, fine. Weird libraries do weird things. This is one way to handle a situation. So you can simply say document as any in parens and then dot animal. And now document is going to be cast as an any type. So here document had document. It still has document, but once it gets outside these parens, document no longer has document. It's now of any type. An animal can exist on any. It's going to be an any, but it's a bad way to handle it. Better way to handle it. Again, you don't have to redeclare the whole thing. Does this work with type? All right, no. Equal. doesn't work with type. So as I mentioned with TypeScript, there are two different syntaxes. There are also two different keywords. It's like var and const. Um, although const actually has a difference. Interface and type are the two ways of declaring a, a type. And they have just slightly different syntaxes. Uh, in the early days of TypeScript, they could do different things. They had different capabilities. These days, not true anymore. Uh, you can do all the same things with both, so you kind of just pick one. Now, in this case, there is a way to do it with type, but it's more code. Um, but so I liked this one. Um, if you do it with an interface, interfaces are additive, so it's simply going to add animal onto whatever is declared as document, and that allows there to be that property, and just with this one simple line of code. So it's a simple trick, but it's uh, kind of nice to know. Uh, you want to step back one second. Even though it's going to error out, you want to just retype that as type document just to show the difference in syntax. Uh, the equal and then the so that works, but what you're going to have to do is Again, use it an as document as new document dot animal equals. So it's just, uh, yeah, it's just a little bit more code. I had this example in here earlier, and I took it out. I, was like, I guess I'll add it back. As is is not as bad as any. It is a safety 
catch that generally if I see as, it means you might be trying to do something not quite right. And in this case, yeah, new document is extended and the interface would be better. But when you do as a type, yeah, let's talk about this. The only one I think that drives me nuts is as const. <laughs> oh, yeah, we don't have an example of that here, but yeah, I use that one a lot. That's the only one that gets me, which is super annoying. You're like, I want it to be read only as const. <laughs> <laughs> Did you say that like it's something about it not being read only if it's const? So yeah, uh, even, even with the keyword const okay. when you make a variable, like what happens if you make an array? You can make an array as a const because you're changing the properties of that variable. So you can do that, same thing with objects. You can't change a string, for instance, like it's gonna be a string, so you can manipulate it as a string, but you can't turn it into a number. All of a sudden, okay. But arrays, you'd be like, "Hey, it's an array, and I'm going to push five. But if you say as const, it makes it read only. It types from saying, "No, you can't do push. <laughs> it's read only." Yeah, uh, it comes up in cases with objects like this, uh, where we have join as a string. But you see, these are keywords, right? These are I'm gonna actually going to be using the letters J O A I, J O I N not just a string. So this is actually too in specific. So the const he's talking about goes here after the declaration. Now, don't get mixed up with this const. This one is JavaScript. That one is TypeScript. Yeah. I but that's why as const is actually really annoying. Now the type definition is not just a string. It is actually the exact string that we had and all the properties we read all of. In this case, you. <laughs> Any. you say you, you. Oh, uh, enumerator. But so uh, here's a good example of that. Case it's not as bad as any. It's not that as should never be used. Sometimes you do need to use as. Um, and similar to our other example, I think actually if we'd used an interface here, we wouldn't need to use as. But this is an interesting trick. It's called branding things. Uh, so if you have a bunch of stuff that is in the unit seconds, um, we only put a number in there, but we brand it as seconds, which is a number and some random piece of uh, some text, colon, some text. These can be anything you want. Underscore brand is what was recommended in the book. And uh, we just say these are seconds. And then if you've got some, a whole bunch of numbers on the page and some are in seconds, some are in milliseconds, others are in minutes, you know you won't accidentally mix those together. If we just try and add another uh, number on there, it won't work unless we also brand that number as seconds. Oh, it's still gonna work. Oh, I think we have to put parens on there. Or something, I don't know. Uh, yeah, I think it's this plus equals that it's not happy about. But um, but yeah, so this is a way that we can just make sure it will err then uh, if we try and buy them because it'll say it doesn't have the correct brand. Does that make sense? Any questions about that? Yeah. So what does the, the and operator do? This is a union operator. So it's saying that it is going to have all of the stuff in this as well as the stuff in this. Um, so think of it similar in JavaScript, you have and, and, um, uh, you also have bar, bar for or in TypeScript is just a single one of either one of those. Although using or in TypeScript can get a little head scratching sometimes. You're like, wait, what am I talking about here? Uh, why, why is it not in 22 to the 60? Um, uh, because this one is simply a number. Whereas this one is a number with a brand. And so it's saying, hey, this number does not have the correct brand. So I, I'm going to error if you try to add them together. Okay. So if we had another one that was in a unit hours and we tried to add one of the minutes to one of the hours, it would be like, hey, the brand here is different on these two. So if you brought in the 22, the seconds, then you could add it. Yeah. Yeah. Let me try and do that just to show it. Um, so so this is just being new to me. So I'm trying to figure it out. We don't need friends. 
and then we say one minute or just spell it right. Now it's happy about those. But if I created a second brand and made these two different, then it would complain about this addition. Okay, so, what, so one minute as it's been run, it will consistently be 60 seconds, whatever happens. And then you have to make a new variable if you want to change that. Correct. And it was the plus equals was throwing it off there because it was converting it to a number and then trying to add it. Okay. So, so why have you used, sorry, I'm asking too much. Okay. Why have you used the let one minute equal 60 seconds and not constant? Uh, there is not a good reason for that. These probably should just be all cons. Two less characters. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> um, I did initially set that because I was using the plus equals. So I was changing the value of this. <laughs> With this now example, I'm no longer changing. <laughs> so they can all be cons. Yeah, before with lat, it, yeah, it was because of <laughs> Well, in my head, like, cons in JavaScript means it can't be changed. So it kind of makes sense. Yeah. When I was doing that, then it had to be changed. Yeah, then it would have to be a lat. Yeah, it would have to be a lat. So. Cool. so sometimes as is a good thing. There are sometimes that as is, like, totally appropriate. But, yeah, as we pointed out, sometimes it's not. So be careful with it. Um, and here's kind of one of the sketchiest, sketchier uses of as. Um, what we want to do here is simply just say as bar. Um, and we're not going to get the error message here, but I'll tell you what the error message would be. The example here, I see this very commonly. The idea is that there's one type that is what we got. And then there's another type which is what we want to give, was what we want to return. So somehow in our code, we need to figure out how to get from the foo type and get our value into the bar type. And we're starting with something that is foo. And we'd like to say, just cast it as bar and bar will be bar. And what happens, I don't think we're getting the right error message. Yeah, no. Um, the error message that you would get on bar is that foo and bar are not don't sufficiently overlap. They're not according to TypeScript, in as TypeScript does its inference, it looks at these two types and says, they don't match. And it says, if you really, really, really want to do this, it actually recommends this solution. Foo as any, well, anything can go to any, and then anything can come from any. So TypeScript no longer needs to match the two types up. Um, this just, gets away with it. What's that? Pretty universal translator. Yeah. Um, now, in this case, unknown would be better. So unknown is a drop-in replacement. And it kind of begs the question, though. This is where I put on my engineer hat. And uh, I've been challenged on this. Why is unknown better here? Why? Because it's not, it's not like any is there. It's foo to start with and it's bar at the end. It's only any like in between, it's just at the briefest, it's like one millisecond. Why does that one millisecond matter? Why is it important for that one millisecond to be unknown instead of any? And there's a very good reason. The reason is that we don't write code for ourselves. We write code for other developers. Every piece of code that you're writing, somebody else is gonna have to look at it later come back and modify something, make some change. And I've worked on so many projects where the earlier developers didn't set us up for success that now when I write stuff, I'm like, this has to be perfect. So when they get here, they know what to do. I really concentrate on that future developer that's gonna have to edit the work that I create. And this is not setting them up for success because they may not know that any is a bad thing. And they may have to break this line into two parts. And as soon as you break it apart, what's in between there? And any. And one real world example that I see, you know, API result, and it's coming from some endpoint somewhere along the line. It's, you know, the API is sending us data. We don't know what the data is. And the developer's like, it's fine. I have confidence. And here, before I export it, I say as book. 
So what's in between there just doesn't really matter, right? I just have enough confidence. I know what I'm dealing with and I'm going to make it all work. And then at the end, I just use as book so that selected book comes out as the right type. But the way that I'm using the word confidence here, that's actually an anti pattern. That's not what we want developers to be doing. We don't want them to be confident. We want them to prove that their code is bug free. And that's what TypeScript gives us. It gives us that validation, that extra layer of, of confidence. We want TypeScript to give us confidence. We don't want to take our confidence in place of TypeScript. And of course, as soon as they go unknown here, then immediately it's like, hey, you can't do that. So it forces you then to take it that extra step and say it's got a book, but I don't, I don't know what that is. Oh, it's used before it's assigned. That's not important. Oh, that, I'm, I'm guessing that's from some other example in the document, maybe. Um, no, this means that I defined it here, but I didn't give it a value, and then I tried to use it here. Ah, uh, okay. So it's just the or. If I give it like equals something, then it would be happy. Say equals one, <laughs> and it's not. So oh, I see. If you um, uncomment the rest of the line, that should fix it then. Exactly. Yeah, it's just that this doesn't exist. Right. Uh, it's the same thing here. If I had said foo equals an empty object or something, then we have it right here. Okay. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So, all right. Um, except unknown and type it. So this is our last big example, kind of winding down here. Um, we'll look at one kind of larger example at the end um, and then have a recap and uh, we'll be done. How are we doing on time? We're good. Oh, 10 minutes. 10 minutes. Okay, good. Um, so this is a, a case where we are receiving something, be it from an API or from some other module or who knows where it comes from, but we're getting a result and we don't know what the result is. We legitimately don't know this library wasn't part of the you know, TypeScript initiative. And so they don't have their types. They just, they don't have the stuff. It, so we don't know what it is. And, but at the end, when we get to the end of processing, we got to know what it is. So how do we do that? How do we take something we don't know what it is and figure out and not have to use confidence in between here? Introducing is. So this is an is function. Uh, and this is the best practice for how to convert something that you don't know what it is into something that you do know what it is. So uh, the Definition for book here. Let's just take a quick look. If you recall that is just a thing. It has a name. It's a string and an author. And that's a string. That's our definition of book. That's the whole bit. That's two properties. So when I say that this is an is function, I'm not talking about the is here. I'm talking about the is here. And you can see that it's doing something very similar to as. Uh, when we say something, you know, value as book. We're saying, ignore your inference, TypeScript, ignore all the things that you think that that thing is, and just immediately make it a book. And just forever from now on, pretend it's a book. So in that way, it kind of doesn't let TypeScript do its thing. It doesn't let the TypeScript do inference. This also does not let TypeScript do inference. Once we run this function, if we can get this function without these error messages, then we run this function. Whatever comes out of it, TypeScript will ignore everything that TypeScript thinks it knows, and we'll just make it a book. So it's similarly forcing like as is, but the idea of an is function is that we are gonna provide all of the confidence right here in one function. This is the test that we're gonna say certifies something as a book. If it passes this test, then it's definitely a book. But then we can be very explicit about that. So this is pretty awesome. Problem is that we get to here and we've got this error. Property name does not exist on type object. Well, what do you mean? Value here is value is what we got. And value is going to be a book. And it's, why can't I even just test? I'm doing a type of. Why can't I even just test to see? No, it won't even let me test. And this would be immensely frustrating 
to me as a, as a JavaScript person coming from JavaScript background, I'm looking at, I would read that error message again and again and again and be like, why, why? Well, the answer is right there. Remember all the way back at the beginning, object doesn't mean what you think it means, right? That doesn't mean it's JavaScript object. That's saying there is no property name on TypeScript type object. Well, why is value an object? Wait, 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 how did this happen? All right, let's check it out here. We came in, we got a known, and we said if type of value equals object, so that should be enough to certify that it is either an object or an array. So we get to here, well, it says object or null. Uh, and then we get to here, we say, it's not an array, not array dot is array value. Well, it still says it's an object. And then we get down to here and it still says it's an object. This is a problem with TypeScript's inference. So TypeScript is trying, it's trying to figure it out. But unfortunately, in order to get a generic object, we need for all three of these to be true. And because inference only happens one line at a time, when we get to the second line, there is no TypeScript type for something that is an object. Uh, yeah, there's no TypeScript type to describe this or just this. And so it continues to rely on its own internal definition of object, which is way too broad. And even though here we say it's definitely not an array, and we know that type object can't accept arrays, it doesn't have one of those. It doesn't have a type to go to. So what we have to do here is just a little bit extra step is we need to tell it it's an object first. So this is what TypeScript was doing is that it was trying to identify the, the value as an object and it was going through in one line after a time, first unknown, but then, yeah, it's an object or null, but when we say it's not null, well, then it's just a generic object. Um, but what we can do is use that generic object definition that we created at the top. And now this is happy, right? These are the three things that we need to certify in order to identify value is in fact an object and not an array and not null. And if we use that is object here, uh, we can then, instead of these three lines, it then does that inference all at once and because it's an is function, it just ignores its own inference and just makes it a generic object. So we get to here, value is a generic object. Generic objects can have properties. We certify that it has the two properties we need. And that is enough to say that it, in fact, is a book. So I didn't actually provide an implementation example here. So let me try and just write one out. You would say, like, you know, const um, my book is a book equals is book of my book. Right. So you're going to pass your book in to this function. It's going to return a true false value as to whether or not your thing is, in fact, the type that that satisfies. So it'll give us a true false value as to whether it's a book or not. Does that make sense? Cool. So key takeaways, don't publish any and uh, avoid ads. Like it can be a real band-aid, a crutch. And uh, so whenever you're using an ads, just ask yourself, is there a better way to do this? If you do know the shape of an object, then describe the shape of the object. You don't have to describe everything, just describe the stuff you're using and then use unknown when you truly don't know. That's what it's for. And then you can use, if you do end up with some unknowns in there, you can use those is functions to validate their value. Some other fun stuff. Um, yeah, people mentioned ui.dev has a lot of resources. I found these type challenges to be kind of interesting. It's good like learning resource. Um, and then there is the TypeScript playground, uh, which can be helpful to try things out if you're not sure what it's gonna do, how to make it work. But yeah, thoughts, questions, comments? It's a lot of little things. So I don't know if I won anybody over <laughs> to the TypeScript camp, but I guess my hope is that 
if you do get into the stuff that you'll at least have a leg up, you'll get there a little faster. Um, and you'll know how to avoid some of the common mistakes. Because again, I, I will see very qualified developers and they'll just check things in. I'm like, why is this any just sitting here? Why? I'm like, oh, I just didn't know that I wasn't supposed to put that in there. So sad. Oh, we have a chat. Oh, uh, someone had a question on chat. Oh. No, that's me if, saying. Gotcha. Uh, if you have a question, okay. just ask. That's about it for for that. Um, the type, the part two of this goes even more advanced, um, and we get into generic types. And I think it's really interesting. Um, <laughs> yeah, any makes my lead super unhappy too. Will um, unknown cause fuss? Uh, will unknown cause fuss? Uh, it shouldn't. Um, the point of unknown is that um, we still don't know what the value is, but if we try to start using an unknown value, it's going to be like, hey, you said you didn't know what this was. Whereas with any, as soon as we go to start using an any, TypeScript just disappears, goes hide and hides in the closet. So that's why, you know, it makes uh, lead devs unhappy is to any because it stops type checking. Unknown does not stop type checking. So it's great. It just is limited in how far it'll go. You can always put it in, but then if you try and use the values, you have to define even further. So that's why lead developers like it. If that makes sense. Um, yeah, part two is kind of advanced. It goes into generic types, which I think is a really interesting topic. But just from our conversation earlier, I'm thinking... Let's talk about Redux. Let's talk about reducers and use state and like that kind of stuff. That's the core React skill stuff that probably would be a little more appropriate to this audience. But yeah, I've got some of that stuff coming up. So oh, great, great. Yeah, and Tyson, thank you for your question. All right, with that, I will uh, turn it back over to Jeff. This, this time but all right um i've got about a half an hour before shop closes up so talk friend there is a little bit of pizza still left i would prefer not to take it home on the train so if you still want food take food please um anywho next month uh third tuesday of the month i'm bad with calendars apparently and i sent out the same email three times going i don't know how these work so i apologize uh, third Tuesday of the month. Uh, next month we have Lee talking about single page application performance. So how to start uh, looking at developer tools and go, is this slow? Yes. Why? So anywho, um, talk. If you're hiring, uh, I would love to talk to you. I would too. Yes. Um, Otherwise, Discord is probably a really fantastic place. Uh, C2C, the Colorado Tech community, is a wonderful community, a lot better than mine. Mine is just very focused. C2C is, is a lot better. Uh, also going to pimp out Denver Script. Denver Script is the fourth Tuesday of the month. And that is up here in uh, Upper Downtown. I don't know the cross streets right now. I drive to that one because there is no great light rail for me. Um, I don't know what their topic is next week. Promises. Oh, that's right. Promises. And um, de demystifying promises of like, what is a promise and how do they actually work? Uh, it's actually something that I just got finished with a few of my students trying to explain promises. And I'm like, it's async in JavaScript and JavaScript is synchronous and, and like, how did we do this? And, and if you ever use Bluebird, you know how promises work, unfortunately. Bluebird was, was promises before promises. And they were actually called features at that point uh, or deferred if you went with jQuery. Anyway, I'm shutting off the stream. 
Thank you all. Cross streets, by the way, are Blake and between 34th and 35th. It's not really cross so much as it is. Yeah, it's in the middle. It's, between it's the code talent is the, the venue. Uh, so Blake and 30th block. Uh, 34th. 34th. All right. Thank you. I'm shutting down stream. Thanks for everyone joining. And stop recording.